having a, we may end up canceling the second class then because we've got quite a few little things we need to do. But we'll see. Let's, let's, uh, okay, Hebrews 11 and verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not as yet, uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. <coughs> and um, we talked about uh, in the last class <coughs> that there were two things that was necessary and that was that he was building an ark and then he had to fill the ark. And um, there were certain preparations that had to be done that he had to be involved in <coughs> and uh, the completion of that ark would take around 120 years with eight people working on it I guess or you know thereabouts and uh, but during that time Noah was to be preaching also and he would be preaching to all the people concerning uh, you know this reality that there was judgment coming he was going to be preaching this reality that there was an answer, a God-given answer, <clears throat> and that God-given answer involved being in something and coming into that. <clears throat> God didn't give Noah several books that outlined a new religion and say, just believe this, and you'll be saved. He did. There were certain things that you needed to believe. I mean, our verse says, by faith. <clears throat> but by faith, he prepared an ark. And um, the, um, let me read a sentence that I had here. Um, he was to preach to all those who were around him, so we see that during that 120 years, Noah's life was filled with two primary things, preaching to the people about judgment slash salvation by an ark, not just salvation. Because it wasn't just salvation. The ark would go through the judgment, and we would be inside of him, but the ark, and that ark representing Christ. And so um, he was, uh, his, Noah's life was primarily filled during that 120 years with two things, preaching to the people about judgment slash salvation by an ark, and also the practical daily task of building into his own life what he was preaching to others. Can I get an Amen. amen. <laughs> Building into his own life what he was preaching to others. He was preaching about an ark. He was preaching about you got to get inside of it. He was preaching uh, all these things in relationship to a doctrine. But for him, it was more than a doctrine. And it was meant to be more than a doctrine because our relationship with Jesus is meant to be more than uh, giving a nod to or giving adherence to religious ways and means. <clears throat> I mean, religion is the biggest problem in the world, whether it be Christianity or anything else. And, uh, but we have been introduced to a person, and we have been introduced to a union with that person, not just a person. I mean, Jesus came to this earth and he taught, but then he died so that we could be one with him. And he taught us what was right. You can read the, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, when they slap you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. You know, when they take your coat, give them your cloak also. But most people won't do that. You can't do that without him giving the life that does it. So he can tell you what to do, you know. And he can, he can uh, and preachers can preach to you what to do. But I think it is an incredibly terrible thing to do to people is to lay heavy burdens upon them of what to do and not give them the life of how to do it and not not let them know that there is a life that this very one who is telling you how to live 
will lay down his life so that he can impart that very nature into you so that it, it will be possible for you to do those things. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And so the answer, and, and interestingly enough, it wasn't just that that life would come in you and keep the Ten Commandments and be, you know, do the religious requirements. No, that life um, would fulfill the law, not keep it. Meaning, it would easily, uh, it, it would easily just fulfill what was required. In other words, what was commandment to an old nature, "Thou shalt not steal," became to that nature, well, thou, thou shalt not steal. You won't steal. You know. When we're living by Christ. Now let's face it. A lot of times we're living for Christ instead of by Christ. Amen? And that's fine except for expect problems. <laughs> expect failures. You know? If we're going to do that. And uh, I, I was talking to somebody recently about, they were, uh, let's see, they were talking about Texas and you know, that we were originally uh, a country before we became a state, and all the blessings that we have. Uh, I think we're like fifth in the world of, of growth in the national product if we were a country again, Something, which is incredible. Think of all the, the other countries and stuff like that. <clears throat> but it, uh, I j my mind harkened back to Spindletop, which is the first big oil gusher that came in, and uh, I, I remembered the story of the... the the couple that lived there on that property, dirt poor farmers, I think it was in the panhandle, just, you know, just dirt poor, nothing. And, uh, you know, he was messing around doing something in his backyard and he found oil and he had him come out and build a rig on his property and that became the greatest rig that ever came in. Long after many that came in after that failed, it just kept going and going and going and going. Well, the thought was, how many years did that couple live dirt poor when underneath, deep underneath, was all of this riches? We call it black gold, Texas tea. <laughs> all of those riches and all of that fullness there, and yet, as long as we're ignorant of it, how will we live? We will live as if we don't have that. Well, Christ is the, uh, the scriptures declare Christ to be the riches that is within us. And it declares that in several different places. But one is we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power or the ability or the dynamo or the, w would not be of us. But it would really be Jesus. And we could depend, you know, I mean... It, it's easy to get discouraged when we present to all of the needs the limitations that are us. It's easy to get discouraged because you only have so much ability. Well, I only have the ability to, you know, do this and that and that's it. And, you know, don't ask me to do anything else. Well, that's it then, you know. And if you don't need those particular things or you only need them ever so often, you're not really very valuable to the kingdom of God. Unless the kingdom of God is more than your abilities. The kingdom of God is the king reigning in you and governing through you and governing over you and through you, presenting his life. <clears throat> and so um, all of these things were... In type and shadow, Noah is not just hearing from God and then going out and preaching it. He's giving himself daily to the task of building this into his life. He's given to the task of making sure that what he's heard from God becomes practical in this life and becomes real to him and therefore to those that are around him. And, you know, there is a lot of there is a lot of preparation. Once you're saved, you just, you just stepped in the door. You know? There is a lot of preparation that God has to do. And a lot of times we become discouraged because we have not gone through the preparation. Or we have, you know, in the case of many, they've heard the truth, they've received Jesus, 
but they wander around going, well, I don't know why I can't do more, and I, why, what is wrong with me, and why, you know, this and that, and, and, they, and, and in some cases they fret and hold back from the Lord. Well, I can understand that. I can understand holding back from the Lord when you think what the Lord is requiring is you instead of Christ in you. I mean, I can understand and going, you know, you know you, you've you come to a right conclusion. I can't do it. That's a right conclusion. But there's more to that conclusion than I can't do it. There's, you're supposed to tack on the end of that. He can. He can. And so <clears throat> um, when I think of that, of preparation, I always think of uh, Jonah. If you will, turn to the book of Jonah. On page uh, 941, <coughs> uh, book of Jonah, and uh, you start considering uh, the preparations, and and a lot of those preparations are not first you doing the preparing for God; it's God preparing you for His task. God working in you that which will be pleasing to him. I think this is a good example of that in Jonah uh, chapter 1, verse 17. Most of you know the story, so I'm not going to go through the whole story. But verse 17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right. That was no accident. First of all, Jesus said, uh, uh, you, you want a sign. You want to see miracles and stuff, right? That's what he said to the people who were saying, well, show us a sign and we'll believe. And what they meant by that was do a miracle for us. And Jesus said, I'll give you a sign. I'll give you the sign of Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. In other words, he was saying to them, I don't want to give you a miracle sign. I'll give you the cross. The cross is the sign. The cross is the answer. The cross is what I'm trying to point you to. And so, in the case of Jonah here, uh, uh, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. I mean, you know, go preach to Nineveh. I don't want to preach to Nineveh. You know, I don't, you know, for whatever reason. You can go through a lot of different reasons and whatever. But he needed preparation yet. There were still things that needed to be built into his life that were not into his life at that point. And so it says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was three days, was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. And so here, even though Jonah <coughs> is not fully aware of the cross, if you will, you can say he's not aware of it at all, or you can say that he may be aware of the principle somewhat. But, but I would say that he didn't know much, but that's okay, God knew. And get what God was putting him through was going to be in relationship to the cross. That the cross, that the reality of this thing has to be built into your life. Jesus didn't say, I'll die on the cross and that's it. He said, you take up the cross daily. Get amen on that one. Well, how often is that? Well, that would be every day. Well, well where? I don't, I don't have a ministry every day. You don't? Your, your ministry, first and foremost, if your hands are chained and you can't move and your mouth is taped, your ministry is Christ and to minister Christ in some form or fashion to allow Christ to live in you. And you can do that every day, all day. I mean, so, so many, many, many ways. And that brings glory to the Father because the Father is getting the Son, which is the gift that He gave you in the first place. And we look around... We look around as to what we could give the Father in return for this wonderful thing, and the answer is we can give Him this wonderful thing, Jesus. We can give Him His Son. We can give Him what has eternally pleased Him. Or we can give Him our flesh, our reactions, our attitudes, or... We can give him our good religious side. I won't give the Lord, I'm not going to give the Lord uh, any attitude. I'm going to give him my good religious side. 
you know, I, if I remember correctly, he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, not lukewarm, you know. <clears throat> and so, you know, this, this I mean, <clears throat> to me, if you're cold, you got a better chance of seeing how bad you need Jesus. But when you're religious, and that's why Jesus, Jesus put up with really bad sinners and people that did stuff wrong and everything and never had a problem with them, but he had a problem with the religious people that were just putting on a front and could never come to the realization of how badly they needed Jesus because in truth, the worst person you could ever witness to is to somebody who thinks they're okay. You know. Well, the worst thing about a Christian serving God is when he thinks he's okay and doesn't need Jesus. Is honestly, I don't know, is there any time that I don't really need this living Jesus? I'm not talking about Savior or saving me from me doing something wrong. I'm talking about the, in, the, the intense desire that my attitudes towards others would be Christ, that my, uh, that my basic tenor of how I proceed would be Christ. <clears throat> well, that's just one scripture. Look in chapter 4, Jonah 4, and uh, verse uh, 6. <clears throat> well, let's start at verse 4. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made a booth for himself and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Because he's mad because God saved him. You know, he, he was angry. Um, so, so he decides he's just going to go sit down and watch what happens. But notice verse 6, and the Lord prepared. Remember that in, in chapter 1, verse 17? The Lord prepared a fish. Now the Lord's preparing a gourd. And made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. So he's going, oh, praise God. Praise the Lord for the preparations of the Lord which to most of us, the preparations of the Lord are all blessing. The Lord is preparing you when he gives you a title and when he gives you a big ministry or something you can be acknowledged over and something that will bring fulfillment to the flesh, to the soul that needs, well, I need to be acknowledged. You know, I mean, you know, the Lord loves us and everything, but I mean, the truth is when it's, when it's just pure flesh saying that to him, he would say back, you need to be crucified. Amen. So, but it, it good, good things are happening now. I mean, before it was a whale. Oh, yeah, prepared of God. And if it's, if it's bad, it's usually the devil. And if it's good, it's God. That's the way we look at it, you know. <clears throat> but then, um, so the last part of verse 6 says, So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Verse 7, but God. Oh, man. But God, please, no. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared, here, there it is. You see all these preparations going on? God prepared, I mean, he prepared a great fish. He prepared a gourd. He prepared a worm. Now he's preparing a vehement uh, wind. Where is it? Uh, ba -ba -ba. Thank you. Prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. All right. <clears throat> we'll just stop right there with the thought of there is a lot of preparation before we're, you know, you can say, Oh, I'm, you know, God's really using me to go minister to Nineveh. To reach a whole city. But God's attention wasn't that much on the city. And the truth is, Nineveh ended up turning back from the Lord. Did you know that? God's not interested in, in uh, people not, he, I mean, he, yeah, you know, they, they turned to the Lord and he offset judgment and all that kind of stuff. But his main attention was toward his own, toward his son, not towards the people his son was ministering to. You understand when I use that, that term, 
we get upset, you know. I mean, I know I have gone through this so many times I cannot tell you. God will jump my case over some little bitty thing that I did, some thing I said or something that was just really small. And then people around me that are Christians, man, they do all sorts of stuff, and he never deals with that. And I've said, Father, what is the deal? Why are you always picking on me, man? I mean, it's like I do the littlest thing, and you jump me, and look at what they're getting away with. I mean, they're getting away with all kind of stuff. Why don't you just spend a little time jumping on them? You know, I've gone through that before many times. And his answer to me is always, well, you're the one who said you wanted to be a son of God. You're the one who said you wanted to be in the image of Christ. You know, they never, they didn't keep at me and keep praying for that over this, the years of their life and years of their ministry. Maybe they prayed it a few times here and there, but you're the one that has consistently come to me and said, I want to be in the image of Christ. You know, so what? You don't like my way of bringing you into that image? <clears throat> well, then you kind of go, well, but could you work on them just for a little while, you know? It is this, <clears throat> this preparation that he's doing and making us into the image of Christ, making us sons of God. You know, what does the scripture say in uh, Isaiah 6? He said, <clears throat> uh, a child is born, but unto you a child is born and a son is given. Well, there it has. A child, he's just born. He's in the family, but he doesn't do much. Poops and burps and everything else. But, I mean, a, a child is born, but a son is given. When that child becomes a son, he begins to help the father. He begins to work towards the father's purposes in the family and not his own. He begins to focus more on what is gre the greater picture? Well, that's the difference. Do you want to be a son of God? Meaning, do you want to be conformed to the image of the son? Do you want Christ formed in you? And if you do, then there's a, you know, there's 120 years of preparation going on here. In other words, in other words, Noah can preach this all he wants, but God is wanting him to build it into his own life. And therefore, the truth is that it's not so much what you do for God as much as how much you conform to the Lord. That's the real deal. And there are, you know, there are ministries, folks, they'll take you in right now. I mean, you can be the most messed up person, and if you're, if you're a warm body, they want a warm body. You know, I've, I've, I've told this story a few times, but I remember one time, I forget, I think it was in Costa Rica, and I was brought up because I was going to be doing a conference there and uh, sat on the, f the front row. I wasn't up there, but I was on the front row, and right in front of me was the worship team. And the main guy doing most of the, the worship and leading everything and playing was this guy, and I'm just, I'm not judging, I'm just telling you the truth. He was so full of himself that it was just sickening. You know, and it was kind of like, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus. <laughs> Look full in his wonderful face. Look what I can do. And I was just going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, please stop the worship. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just, just horrible. And it was just like, oh, anybody seen Job of the Hut, you know? The flesh was just like, oh, oh, yeah. you know, God, worship Jesus. Yeah. I don't think so, dude. God's not pleased just with doing things for him. It's the spirit in which we do it. It's the heart in which he does. And you've heard it oftentimes. He wants your heart. Most of the time, he's got our hands. Most of the time... You know, he's, he's got us when it's time to do a big thing, you know. But he wants, you know, uh, he's the one who said, be faithful in that which is least and I will give you more. Do you believe that? Do you believe that if, if he gives you a little bit, you treat it like it's everything? 
you pray over it, and you love it, and you, you know, you know, <clears throat> and I mean, I remember when, you know, here Cassie's pregnant, but I remember when, when Deb was pregnant with the girls, and I remember before they were born, I started praying for their husbands, and I started praying for their life, and I started praying for what God was going to do, and I started praying for way down, I mean, it was so far down the road, you couldn't even think about it, and yet I could think about it because God had given me that, and I wanted to be faithful with what I had and trust that God would do more with it, you know? I wanted to see the hand of God in the future and not just at the moment. And, and so I began to realize that even the slightest things, that's where the Lord is at. That's where the Lord is at. Not in the big things, but in the slightest things, you know. And he said, Jesus said stuff like that. He said, you know, if you uh, don't be like the Pharisees who pray on the corners and they get everybody's attention and all this stuff, and he said, they have their reward. He said, you know, but go into your closet where only God sees. And there, show him your heart. There, be with him. So, I mean, how important is it to comprehend Noah, who who has got hold of this thing, and he realizes that we're we're the only ones on the earth holding up the banner. We've got to build this into our lives. We cannot just talk about this stuff. We can't write books about it and form a place based on the doctrine of it. Our lives must reflect this beautiful one, this person, this precious Lamb of God. Our lives must reflect Him. And so, let me just read a little more here because getting getting a little further down the road here. How long he would do this, building it into his own life, was unknown to himself. God did not tell him. Just be faithful until the appointed time of the Father. Just be faithful. Just keep doing what you know to do faithfully, and God will take care of the rest. God wants you trusting in him as a lifestyle and not just looking at times and seasons. Short-term mission. You know, there was a time period in my girl's life when short-term missions was the biggest thing going. And, uh, and basically, the concept is this. Don't go be a missionary for the rest of your life. Just go on a six-week or four-week or two-week trip. Give everything you got to Jesus during that two weeks, and then come back and go back to your old lifestyle. And that became, believe it or not, that actually became popular among Christians. Can you believe that that would become a very popular thing? Well, of course it would, you know. I remember when we, my wife and I were, were in, the Bible, in the Bible college that we went to, and they said to us, well, when you graduate, we want to send you to Jamaica as a missionary. And their way of doing that was we understood that if we went, we could be there for life. In our minds, it was for life. Now, at that time... Two years after that, Jamaica went communist, and they would not renew our visa. And so we had to leave because they wouldn't renew our visa. But in our mind, we didn't know that was going to happen. As long as we knew this is it. I mean, God sent us here. They sent us here. We will live and die and have our children and our life and everything, but this is what we will be given to. Well, you're not going to do that unless unless there's something more in you and some greater desire in you than living per se. You know, short-term missions is a wonderful thing, and it's a great way to get kids out there and stuff, but in my opinion, if it doesn't get them out there and then get them back and have them on fire and get them moving for God on a daily basis, in the, you understand? I mean, that's, you know, for a son of God, that's not difficult. For a, a earth-bound Gravity held person who is pulled by the earth, you're asking the impossible. That's why you can't preach missions or anything else. You preach Christ, and Jesus will fulfill the need. 
He will be faithful. He will do this. He will do that. That's why we preach Jesus so much here. I mean, we could put a lot more emphasis on ministry, but everybody else is doing that. I mean, you know, there's a Bible school in, in Dallas that, man, they, thousands go through there every year, thousands of people. And many of those, I would say a huge portion of those people do not graduate and go into ministry. I've found them all over Dallas. I've found them doing jobs here and there and there and there. You know, say, well, you know, so you went to Christ for the Nations? Yeah, yeah, I went there for, you know, how length of time the, the program was. So what are you doing now? Well, you know, once I graduated, I just got a job, and I'm just sort of, what are you doing for the Lord? Well, you know, I mean, because there's no life and there's no oomph unless you're in a big group with everybody shouting and going, yeah, Jesus, and that lasts, you know, until you go out to a flat tire on your car. So, uh, the ark and this method of deliverance was devised wholly by God and conveyed to Noah. If God had not revealed to him, had not revealed it to him, he would not have known about it. However, Noah had to take the divine concepts and build it into his daily life. And you know, there's an abundance of scriptures in the New Testament that show that. Uh, over in Ephesians two. Um, Ephesians 2 and verse uh, 8, uh, 9 and 10, says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What did that just say? You don't do it by works, but, but we are his workmanship. We're not working on stuff for him. He's working on stuff for us, and we are his workmanship created unto good works by Christ uh, through the instrumentality of Christ. All right. Let's add to that um, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 and verse 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right. So one says it's not of works, but then it says, but you will do good works but it's the result of you being his workmanship, not you working for him. It's a different, big difference, huge difference. But then, here he says, well, and I, I like how he do, his words are good. He says, Where, you know, wherefore, my beloved, he's, he's not treating them like they're messed up and off. He's treating them like they're one and like they're loved and like they're in the family of God. But then he says, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He's saying, you, you're like sons of God. You obey not because I'm standing here over you with a stick, but because it's in you to do it. And then he says, because you have to work out what God is working in. Work out your own salvation, for it is God who worketh in. It's not that... Not what both those verses together say. It says, work out what he works in, basically. That's the short version. <laughs> That's the Randy Nussbaum paraphrase. Work out what he's working in. And the only way you really know you've got something is when it's been worked into. You know, for example, God says to, to Adam, okay, don't eat of that tree over there. Okay, you know, so first opportunity devil comes along and says, hey, eat of this. And so they eat of it. You know. Let's say that there was a span of two days between God saying don't eat it and the, they ate it. For two days, I'm sure they thought they were such men and women of God. 
God spoke to us. He entrusted us with his word. We will keep it forever. Oh, glory to God. In your life, it may have been two weeks or two months or two years or ten years between when he said this and when you got tested over it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you get tested over it and you go, oh, my God, oh, you know, you asked me to do it, but I can't do it. I mean, I messed up. And, you know, and we think that we can do this stuff. We really believe that. That's human pride. Human pride. It's going to take a big fish and a gourd and a worm and, a, you know, it's going to take all kind of things, basically just showing us how much we need Jesus and that God's plan always was that it would be Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's not a foreign concept to him. And it's not a, uh, he's not upset over the fact that you can't do it and that you're having to look to Jesus. He he wanted more than just to sit on a big throne like Pharaoh and have everybody come and ask him for everything. You know? He wanted to sit on the throne of our heart and yet give us free will at the same time. What an incredible dichotomy if you think about it. God in you, free will. Let's make this easier. Just put God in us, his life, his nature, and let her roll. Yeah, it would, that would be sweet. <laughs> That's right. And there is, this, there is this thing where Jesus gave his life that we might live. Now, by the grace of God, we are able, by Galatians 2.20, to give our life that he might live. I am crucified with Christ. He was crucified for me that I would live. Now, I am crucified that he might live. In other words, we're partaking together. We're feasting on the same bread of life, the same food, the same sustenance. The thing that sustains him and gives him strength and, and that is life to him is life to us. And this was the, the whole thing I was trying to get into with the, the feasts and the, uh, but particularly the uh, offerings and never got a chance to get into the, the meal offering or meat offering uh, and the peace offering. I only got into one. But the progression through those fee or those offerings is incredible. I never even got a chance to touch on it, but it's really, really incredible because you move from one where Jesus is glorified as everything in the, in the whole burnt offering, where God wholly, completely wants Christ, to we're sitting at the table eating the same stuff God's eating when you get to the peace offering. You've come to a place where you appreciate what it is that he appreciates. And that it, it moves you like it moves him. The preparations are working. He's bringing your heart towards him, not just, you know, not just lining things up so that you'd get it right. I believe anyone who's born again truly does love Jesus. I believe that. I believe they really love Jesus. I just don't believe we always understand how to express that love. And I think that we try to express it by doing things for him. And that's religion. That's the old covenant way. And it was a way, and God made a covenant, but guess what? That's over with. And now, he's bringing us into oneness so that we can love him the way he loves us. So that we can... Uh, uh, love the things that he loves, which when it comes to the Father, the thing he loves is Christ. And he loves this self-giving nature. Well, it's not in our nature to love being self-giving. It is in our nature to be selfish. And you talk about preparations and all that. Folks, one of the, I mean, let me just clarify this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What, what the Lord is not trying to do is just prepare you to, by teaching you how to pray for people or teaching you how to, uh, you know, 
set up the church for a service or to do run the sound or do something like that. Folks, there are things within each one of us, they're all very different, that are our was our way of how we coped and got by before we met Jesus. Did anybody hear that? Ways that it's how we coped and got by before we met Jesus. And usually when we come to Jesus, those things remain. In fact, we're, we're trying to deal with, you know, putting, you know, stop chewing tobacco and, you know, doing all these kind of outward things. But there are basic things in us that he has to build Christ into us, build an art consciousness into us, and take away some of these things. And, and they are so different and varied between people. I mean, one person, the way they cope and the way they get by is that they act weak and everything. Well, I, I can't do it. I just need your help. And so people do that. And the other way is that they uh, intimidate people, you know, well, you know, you just, you know, and that gets you to, or the other way is that they, you know, it's another form of the other, but it's a manipulation. They'll manipulate you till, you till they get their way. Or they, you know, they, there's so many different aspects but and you'll ne you you know most people don't even know what what it is that you're gonna it's gonna require the Lord to put you through some paces to look and go you know what every time I get in this situation here's how I get out of it and it's usually getting out of something Were you wanting to com comment yeah Sure, uh, me of all people. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, Greg was just saying that it's like people have almost a, a relationship as a drug addict or something, and and uh, <coughs> a lot of people use the Lord to to uh, to meet their needs, but the need that they're trying to get him to meet is uh, areas of selfishness or laziness or whatever. Now, I want to tell you, when the Lord first began to deal with me about this kind of stuff, I was in my early 20s and didn't want to hear it. And I'm being honest. It, he was dealing with me about attitudes and ways and means that I got out of stuff or I, you know, whatever. And it was very, very hard on me. It was very hard on me because... Here was, here was the conclusion I came to when he was dealing. You're not just dealing with things. You're dealing with who I am now. And I don't know if I want you meddling in that area. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it was hurting and freaking me out, and it was showing me stuff that I didn't want to see, and that, you know, like I said, every time I get in a certain situation, I didn't realize I did that. But then the Lord showed me that. And then when I began to get in those situations, I would predict. And I could predict correctly because I was a coping mechanism, not a son of God. Is that, do you all know what a coping mechanism is? It's our way of dealing with, with situations. And I, I was more of a, not a human being even. I was this particular coping mechanism that I had chosen. And, and, uh, and I saw that Christ will never in, in the core of my being ever really be established unless I'm willing to want to build that Jesus into this life. He must increase, though, and I must decrease. And that's a, you know, I hear that scripture quoted all the time. He must increase and I must decrease. But usually when people are saying it, they're only thinking of him increasing. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, he must increase, you know. Well, how about you decrease? Well, what? I didn't think of that. I mean, it's just a man, you know. But, I mean, that's where we decrease. The area I'm talking about right now, building Christ into your life as far as his nature and his way. And I mean, he said, I am the way. He's not giving us a way. He will be that way in us 
but he cannot override your will. He, well, he can, but he won't. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he can. He's God. He can do anything he wants. But he chose to give you free will. And if you say, no, I don't, you know, I want to be a Christian in, in word and in involvement, but not in um, motive and way of dealing, then he won't mess with you. You know, and I know some people say, why is this taking so long? You know, I can't seem to, da, 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 da. Well, maybe you're not, you know. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and you sit and ignore. <laughs> you know, can I come in? No. You know, and maybe we'd never say it blatantly like that. We'd just go, we'd use one of our coping mechanisms. We hear a knock, and we go, oh, I need to fix this over here. Or, you know. Oh, I need to be excused right now. I've got, uh, you know, I mean, you understand? I mean, we're just, we got it all figured out. And yet, it's, you know what? It's really amazing because it's not a mental figuring out. We didn't figure this thing out mentally and set out to use it. What we did is we figured out in life up to that point what sort of work that kept us from just totally going off the deep end. You know. And, and let me tell you this. No, don't tell me anymore. <laughs> I, I think many true core cop coping mechanisms probably have kept us from either going insane or being deeply ruined or something. If they were our best attempt at staying right. Even as a sinner, I mean. But it's still not the Lord. So there comes a time when you have to make that transition, and there's no scarier, I, I'm telling, in my opinion, there's no scarier place than when you start making the transition because you are leaving what is secure and going to what you don't know that well, which is Christ and his life and nature. And the lack of familiarity with it already will make you scared, you know, because you know what I'm saying, because we like to have confidence and we like to, you know, so it's like, and when you let go of that one, but don't fully have this one yet, you're kind of going, ah! you know, that's called a transition. <laughs> you know, ah! you know, we're freaking out. Well, you know, and then a lot of people go, oh, no, oh, no, and then they rush back and they grab a hold of what they're, that's it, that's it, I ain't going, you know. Well, again, God won't force you. But if your heart really is for the Lord, sooner or later you're going to come back to that point again. And Lord willing, maybe it will be saying, you know, and see, the deal is not, I want to get rid of my bad ways. It's really not that. I want to get rid of my coping. The real deal is, is I want to build Christ into my life. I don't want to just preach to everybody the truth. I mean, you can... You, you know, Noah could have walked around and preached building Christ into their life and never built an ark. But now, to be honest with you, how effective would his preaching be even if it was worded accurately? And I, I say, it's just words there. You say, but they're the best words ever. They're, they're truly the Lord in order and in, in the order of the words and everything. I say, if you're not building Christ in your own life and you're telling somebody else to do it, it'll have no impact. It'll be, you know, people might go, well, that's, that's good. Well, what else is there? I mean, you know, wonder what's on TV or whatever. But if, but if, if you're going to, if it's life to you and it's something to you, then when you begin to impart that, impact will start hitting the arrows of the Almighty. And after all, when you preach, do you just want to talk and people at the end go, oh, great sermon. I mean, I have preached in countries where there were thousands of people there, and when I got through, they broke out into incredible applause. And I'm not joking and I'm not bragging. I'm telling you a fact. And I wa start walking off, and they're just going, oh, I mean, just like a electricity in the air. I turned around and walked back to the mic, and I said, it has nothing to do with what I'm preaching. But will we live this? Will I live this? That's what's important. And then walk back and it was silent. <laughs> you know. Because what's the point of I mean pardon? 
Yeah. You know, what is the point of a pep rally? <laughs> and in those little things, you start catching yourself and going, I, man, I want it to be the Lord. I want it to be the Lord. Here, we, how much time we got left? We need to make sure we... Okay. I think I can read in six minutes. Okay, the Bible says, faith without works is dead. Okay, here's my little translation of that. Truth without fruit is doctrine. Faith without works is well, what does that mean? Truth without fruit is doctrine. <coughs> you know? <coughs> By faith, Noah moved and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. There's faith in what it is. I have faith in what I'm preaching so much so that I'm going to build it into my own life and my own family's life. I believe there's so much, I have so much faith in it. Well, you better. Because when the rains come, there will not be a doctrine bubble around you. And I will tell you this, if all that you have is based on your doctrines, things, I'm just going to warn you right now, things can get so bad, it will shake your doctrines to the very core. You will, I mean, all of the little sayings that used to feel so good and seem right, when you're in that situation, they're just cliches, and you go, I don't want to hear this. This is sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. I don't want to hear it. Does anybody have anything of life? Please talk to me. And if you don't, shut up. You know, that's what you feel like. You know, <clears throat> so so you know how that feels, right? You you know how that feels. Well. Don't sit there and think, well, yeah, I want, I want people, when they preach to me, I want them to be building it in their life. No, 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 that's not my point. My point is you build it into your life. You know, you make sure that what you're communicating comes out of life and that you're intense to get the Lord. Yeah, Robert? Yeah, it was, yeah. No, no, I'm teasing. Go ahead and share what you're saying. <laughs> That's why I don't watch them. I just get upset. Hello. Well, I think, see if this has anything to do with that. I, you know, Job was the one God was dealing with, right? I mean, through that thing. And so it says that his God, when he got through, he rebuked those guys and said, well, as far as saying what was right, Job said what was right, and you didn't even say what was right. And then he dealt with Job. And he said, where were you when the cre where this was created? Where were you this and that and that? And he begins, and so when God gets through with Job, Everything he said that was right didn't matter. All of a sudden now he says, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I've seen thee face to face and now I abhor myself in sackcloth and repent in sackcloth and ashes. He came to a revelation of Christ. Amen. And that's the deal is that you can know everything right, refute everybody, and still not know Jesus. And that's why 
why we're here. That's why this place exists, and that's why, you know, that's why, uh, you know, I, I, I have a feeling I'm not the only one who stands up here in these Bible school classes and just, you know, you know, like this. Uh, you know, I just have a feeling that there might be others who are going, this is our life. We, you know, I mean, I don't, maybe they don't, but... <coughs> Yeah. All right, let me see if I can finish this. What? Oh, I have zero seconds left. Well, then I'll, I'll finish this anyway. <coughs> uh, in the wilderness, Moses was told to have Israel construct the dwelling place of God in their lives exactly as it was in the heavens. They were not simply to, de- to believe in a heavenly reality, but to pray that it would come in their earth in the same fashion as it already was in heaven. And then 1 John 4, 17 again, as he is in the heaven, so are we in this world. Amen? All right. Shut your machines down, and uh, do we want to take a break and then come back and decide how we'll proceed?